And now it is my absolute pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker this morning. He's bubbly, he's bouncing, he is celebrating the birthday boy himself, our own Reverend John Scott, the beloved Reverend John. I'm not the only one bubbling and bouncing. <laughs> good morning, family. <laughs> and thank you for the lovely blessing and all the good wishes, and we're glad for you now. Happy, happy, happy Sunday, happy Heroes Weekend, and uh, uh, just a wonderful greeting to those who are joining us uh, in consciousness and listening to us or watching us on the World Wide Web. Uh, a friend of yesteryear, had a charming practice, um, which I have adopted. And it was to just, without any reason at all, give a token or a gift. It might just be a book or a CD or just something. Um, and it always had a tag on it which said, just because, dot, dot, dot. And I used to smile when those gifts came because I, I would imagine what that, those dots implied, you know, what was behind them? Just because I love you? Just because I thought of you today? Just because this whatever it is, this something reminded me of you? Just because. And I think that that is perhaps one of the things that inspired to our national heroes. I don't think people who do heroic things and, and rise to the heights of, you know, um, human, human excellence and um, that change the course of w world history. I don't think they set out to do that. I think they just do what they feel they had to do just because. And we in the science of mind know that our principle is that we are cause to our experience. So I've titled my encouragement this morning, Just Be Cause. As we celebrate our national heroes, I want us to con consider this way of being, being caused to what we want to experience in our lives. You know, when I first found this teaching 38 years ago, I awakened to two simple but life-altering truths. The first was that God is really all there is. The Sunday morning that Reverend Elmer Lumsden, our founding minister, articulated this, my friend Larry Chang, who introduced me to this church and who always got it first, you know, he always latched on very quickly, said, and I quote, this is totally logical, John. After all, if we are created in the image and likeness of God, then we are indeed part of what God is, and God is all of what we are, unquote. I said, you mean all the old dirty criminal them too? And of course, he was exasperated. He said, Lord John, you, you can label me? That's a judgment. Remember, Reverend Elmer said, judge not lest ye be judged. And so summoning all of my dignity and that I could and my, you know, apparent wisdom, I said, that wasn't Reverend Elmer, that was Jesus. Put him in his place. But of course, it is a truth, and she said it too. The second truth which seriously changed the direction of my life was coming to an understanding of the law of cause and effect, which creates our experiences in life by means of our individualized use of this awesome power. Again, friend Larry explained it effortlessly. I quote, this means that what is going on within us at the spiritual, mental, and emotional level will eventually manifest in our outer world of experience, clothed as the conditions, events, encounters, and circumstances of our life, unquote. I have to admit that at first the concept that I am the sole cause of all my experiences was really a hard frog to swallow until I realized that this was a truly empowering concept. For if I am the sole cause of all my, my own effects, the things that are happening to me, then I can change the effects by simply initiating a new cause, and no one could do a thing about it. This new awareness explained why, at the time, I had been experiencing so much conflict, confusion, and chaos in my departure from my former high-flying job. 
All the pain and angst were simply the effects of a mind, mine, which wasn't at peace with itself. Yes, there were other players in the game of my life, but I had, by virtue of my own consciousness, not only picked the team that I was playing on, I had also picked my opponents. It was all my mind. Wow. Friends, believe me, as soon as I took responsibility for all that was happening in my outer world by acknowledging that it was a reflection of what was happening in my inner world, I began to notice significant changes in my life that matched the sense of freedom, autonomy, inner peace that I was feeling inside. As if by magic, my painful separation from a company I had helped to build and had served for 20 years became a celebration of a new beginning. And the universe is so exquisite. I, I was making that change in 1981, the same year that I came to the Temple of Light. I was so excited and grateful for what I was learning here at the temple that I made myself a promise that I would be at service every Sunday excuse, as long as I was in the island. And I'm happy to say I honored that intention. And even when I was at work in the country parts of Jamaica, I would drive or fly back to Kingston on a Saturday evening in order to be at service on Sunday morning. And if I wasn't here, Reverend Hammer would say, where were you, dear? Were you off the island? Mind you, the changes for the better that I began experiencing in my life required a willingness to let go. And I really want you to think about this. Letting go of that which no longer served me in an uplifting and life-affirming, healthy way. In his book, The Art of Being, Science of Mind luminary, Dr. Dennis Merritt Jones, writes, and I quote, manifesting any kind of peace, inner or outer, will require some form of deep letting go of our attachment to something, unquote. Now, my friends, that something could be as intangible as a belief or an expectation of others, or it could even be an old resentment that you need to let go of. On the other hand, the something that you need to let go of could be as tangible as money or property, and sometimes it may even be a person or relationship. Hmm, that's a hard one. Whatever it is, letting go is an important prerequisite for manifesting and maintaining peace, prosperity, and fulfillment in your life. Of course, the converse is true. Hanging on too tightly to anything or anyone will become cause to the effect of conflict, unhappiness, and pain. So in either case, the same law is at work. As within, so without. There is a classic Zen story about letting go that is told in many different versions. And the version I will share with you this morning is told by author Harriet Lerner, who writes, one of my favorites appears in a book for young readers by John J. Muth called Zen Shorts. Two traveling monks, they reach a town, this is in the olden days, where there was a young woman in all her beautiful royal robes, waiting to step out of her sedan chair. But the rains had made deep puddles, and she couldn't step across without spoiling her silken robes. Well, we don't wear silken robes around Jamaica, but I wonder if she was in Kingston over the past week. She stood there looking very cross and impatient, and she was scolding her attendants about the condition of the road. You know, we always find somebody else to blame. What are you doing about it? They had nowhere to place the packages they held for her, and so they couldn't, with their hands full, help her across. So the younger monk noticed the woman, said nothing, and walked by. The older monk quickly picked her up and put her on his back, transported her across the water, and put her down on the other side of the street. She didn't thank the older monk. She just shoved him out of the way and departed haughtily. As they continued on their way, the young monk was brooding and preoccupied. And after several hours, unable to hold his silence any longer, he spoke out. You know, that woman back there was very selfish and rude, but you picked her up on your back and carried her, and then she didn't even thank you. I set the woman down hours ago, said the older monk. Why are you still carrying her? 
A lot of us carry old resentments, do we? And they're like, they're like a weight on our shoulders. You know, we just refuse to put them down. And we tell the story over and over and over again. We relive it, you know, with great satisfaction as, to as many people as will listen. As Miss Lerner, Lerner writes, it, and I quote, it feels good to let go, not when other people tell us to let go and move on, but when we ourselves see the necessity of it. Letting go doesn't mean forgetting or whitewashing the other person's behavior. It means protecting ourselves from the corrosive effects of staying stuck. Chronic anger and bitterness fuels our spirit when we hold on to anger and resentment and hurt. If 5% or 75% of the energy that that occupies is directed toward carrying someone on our backs who has wronged us, then that same percentage is unavailable for other pursuits that would take us forward to our, to our goals and to our aims and our dreams in life. If anger keeps us stuck in the past, we won't be fully in the present, nor can we move forward into the future with our full potential for optimum success and joy. We don't need to forgive a particular bad action when the other person fails to genuinely apologize or acknowledge the wrong. We just need to let it go. And I usually just say, just say, I release you to your greater good. Go free. So this brings me to your assignment. And since we have a long weekend here in beautiful Jamaica, I have a three-part assignment for you. The first part of your mission, should you decide to undertake it, is a mindfulness practice recommended by Dr. Dennis Mary Jones, which you can do every day this week as part of your spiritual work. And it's a simple exercise, but it's very effective. Make a conscious effort to breathe deeply with mindfulness. And as you draw a deep breath in, hold it for as long as you can and ask yourself, what am I clinging too tightly to today? Just breathe in and hold it and think, what am I holding on too tightly? And then as you exhale, just simply say, I let go. If you, nothing comes to mind, you know, you think, what am I holding on too tightly and nothing specific comes to you. Just say, I let go of everything that no longer serves me. So just try that breathing exercise in your, your daily spiritual work. Breathe in, hold it, and ask yourself, and listen to that in a still small voice. What am I hanging on to that no longer serves me? And as you exhale, exhale say, I let go. Worth trying? Two people said yes. <laughs> the second part of your assignment was originally suggested way back in 2009 by the late Daisy Rain, who shared with me that she had read somewhere that during World War II, an advisor to Winston Churchill had organized a group of people who dropped whatever they were doing every night at a prescribed hour to pray for one minute for England. And there was an amazing effect which they attributed to that moment of just pausing to pray. The bombing ceased. And Daisy wrote me suggesting that we at the temple could do this for Jamaica. So your assignment is to pause every evening at 7 o'clock, just as the evening news is announced on TV, and say a quick affirmative prayer of peace for Jamaica. You can say something like, God is peace, that peace begins with me and fills this neighborhood, this island, and the world as the waters fill the sea. Can we say that together? God is peace. God is peace. And that peace begins with me. It fills this neighborhood, this island, and the entire world as the waters fill the sea. It fills this neighborhood, this island, and the entire world as the waters fill the sea. So assignment part one, breathe in meanfully, hold your breath, and ask silently, what am I clinging too tightly to? And then as you exhale, let it go. Assignment part two, pause every evening at seven and affirm peace within yourself, your neighborhood, and Jamaica. I'll give you number three in a little while. So friends, as Dr. Mary Jones puts it, and I quote, we are each but microcosms of the macrocosm. We are in the small what God is in the big. 
Our world is no different than any of our personal lives in the respect that peace on our planet will continue to elude us as a species until we as individuals make peace within ourselves, unquote. When we come to the realization that God is truly all there is, we come to a sense of peace and the assurance that the presence and power is truly at the center and circumference of our lives. As this happens, we begin to experience the expansion of our consciousness in much the same way that the beautiful Jesus explained the kingdom of heaven in a wonderful one-sentence, one-line parable found in Matthew 13, uh, verse 13. I don't know if you remember it, but I'll read it to you. It's one sentence. I quote, Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. End of that scripture. Just a short, short sentence. Likening the kingdom of heaven to a piece of yeast hid in flour and allowed to just be there until it rises. And I thought, wow, each of us is like a piece of, of that leaven. You know, and we are in the dough of Jamaica. And if we just allow it and allow ourselves, it will rise. We, will, we don't have to do a thing. We just have to be. We just have to allow ourselves to be here and to allow our light and who we are and what we believe to just absolutely shine so that it, be, it begins to allow all of Jamaica to rise to its amazing potential. Roca Erico, the Aramaic scholar, explains that the term kingdom of heaven in Aramaic, which was the language Jesus spoke, is Malkutha Dashmaya. Malkutha Dashmaya, which is not a reference to a place one goes to after death. It means the kingdom of God or God's sovereign counsel. So Jesus was likening God's majesty to a woman doing an ordinary everyday chore, making bread. And he always used everyday activities because like the science of mind which we teach, it's an everyday way of being. It's not just a, a, an act of worship on one day of the week on a Sunday. It is a way of life, a lifestyle which is transformative. And so Erica, no, Erica notes that th uh, uh, three measures of flour is 50 pounds. So Jesus, in the tradition of the Middle East at that time, exaggerates the amount of, of flour. The, the, the storytellers of that time made everything bigger than life so that you could see that just a, a pinch, you know, he talked about a pinch of salt um, making the stew taste better. Just a pinch of that leaven. And if you think of yourself, you're just one tiny aspect of all of the, of the happenings of humanity. But you bring the uniqueness and the purity and the sacredness of your presence to life, to earth. And like a piece of yeast, you can make everything and everyone around you rise to the heights of human excellence and human joy and, and take it to the levels of pure divinity. And that is really why we are here. So I believe that God's sovereignty was and is working like leaven that is hidden in the dough of Jamaica's beautiful consciousness. Our heroes sung and unsung were that leaven and we too are that leaven. So as a spiritual community, we need to know that it is constantly fermenting the hearts and minds of our people, gradually changing them into the kingdom of God, bringing peace, love, harmony, and understanding so that we as a nation can feed the entire world with the bread of peace. What an assignment, and what a, if we really want to make this a world that works for everyone, then we need to offer the chalice of our love and the bread of peace to everyone we meet upon life's path. Oh, and before I close, here is the third part of your assignment. Think of someone who has been a hero in your life and give them a token of your appreciation this week with a note that says, just because, dot, dot, dot. I would like to close with the words of a great man who answered the call to just be cause. 
The Right Honorable Marcus Mazaya Garvey, born in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica in 1887. In his short 52-year lifespan, Garvey rose to become one of the world's most influential leaders. His brilliant oratory, his grasp of philosophy, and his newspaper, Negro World, founded in 1920, brought him millions of followers all over the world. In fact, legend has it that Garvey's organization was and is still the largest international, international organization of all times. He was the leaven in the flower of human history. And this is what he wrote. It's taken from his writing on the function of man. I quote, to me, a man has no master but God. Man in his authority is a sovereign lord. As for the individual man, so of the individual race. This feeling makes man so courageous, so bold, as to make it impossible for his brother to intrude upon his rights. So few of us can understand what it takes to make a man. The man who will never say die. The man who will never give up. The, the man who will never depend upon others to do for him what he ought to do for himself. The man who will not blame God who will not blame nature, who will not blame fate for his condition, but the man who will go out and make conditions for himself. If 400 million Negroes can only get to know themselves, to know that within them is a sovereign power, is an authority that is absolute, then in the next 24 hours, we would have a new race we would have a nation, an empire, resurrected not from the will of others to see us rise, but from our own determination to rise, irrespective of what the world thinks. End of that quote by national hero, the Right Honorable Marcus Mazaya Garvey. My friends, the level of God's sovereign power within you is cause to your effect, and you are called to just because. And that's why I love you, just because. Namaste.